Um, I got my MPH at UCLA in 1900, and um, I never, I did it. Here's it. This is the truth. The reason I got my MPH at UCLA is because my mom told my new wife, my only wife, but my new wife, that she thought it would be a good idea for me to get my MPH. So I did, not knowing what it would get me or where I would end up. What's that have to do with your new wife? Well, and she's the one that coerced me into it. They went from my mom to my wife to me. So the point of the discussion was, is that um, I am now the public health officer for Orange County. I've been doing this for three and a half years, and it's the best job I've ever had. It is a blast. So let me offer to you, if you're at all interested, that you can shadow me anytime. And I open it up to students all the time. All right, so here's the question. And I want to see some volunteers on this. And Paul's going to write some of the responses down. Who wants to tackle question number one? Why should we, the big W society, be responsible for the homeless? Yes, sir. Because homelessness is not an individual failure and society should take care of its people. Good answer. Do you all agree with that? Yes. Say it again. Say it again. Because homelessness is not an individual failure and society should take care of its people. All right, good answer. Somebody else, one sentence. Yes, ma'am. Um, we as a society should be responsible for the homeless because as a society, we have the means to support those who are homeless. So we should be responsible for the homeless. Because we have the resources, we should use them for the homeless. Is that right? Okay, good answer, too. Somebody else. Yes, sir. Uh, kind of goes along with you know, these answers, but uh, homelessness can happen to anybody. So. Um, we should you know, take care of that's society. Your, yeah. This is a big one. Yes. So say it, say it in one sentence as succinctly as you can. Society should take care of, or should be responsible for the homeless because it could be um, any member of society that experiences it. Okay. Everybody hear that? No, say it again. You got it. I'm hearing the back. Now you're going to get it right. <laughs> Society should be responsible for homelessness because it could be any member of society that experiences it. So it could be any one of us. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, you knew I was going to pick on you, didn't you? Yeah, I was going to Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, contrary to popular belief that people are homeless because of their own faults, I believe that our society plays a huge role in creating homeless individuals due to the skyrocketing housing costs and the lack of programs to get homeless individuals out of that cycle. So that's a good, very good answer too. So we're part with, let me paraphrase it, since we're partly the cause for their homelessness, play some role in society, then we're responsible for them. Okay, anybody else want to add to the big we? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's like that song, the Michael Jackson song, we're saving our own lives. So it's the impact that they, the negative impact homelessness would have on society. All right. Look at that was very good. Now let's look at question number two. Question number two: Why should you, as individuals, take responsibility for the homeless? Okay. Watch my lips. <coughs> Why should you, as individuals, take responsibility for the homeless? Yes, sir. Because we live together. Okay? Because we live together. Good answer. I'm going to pick on somebody if I don't see anybody. Yet. For the same reasons that we as a society all the same five reasons. Did you hear that? For the same reason. Okay? Yes. It starts at like a micro level, like... Like, if someone's very passionate about it, they can build it into, like, something. Say it again. Stand up. What's your, and tell us who you are. Hmm? Okay, not to put you on the spot, but I am. Okay. Well, um, I think it's, like, at a micro, or micro level, and if you're really passionate about it, then you can build it something, like a business. Ah, uh, if you're passionate about it. Yes. Okay. So, passion, Paul. So, now, let me ask you the question. How do you convert the small W in we to the big W? What does it take to convert it? 
How do you take one individual's passion and make it a societal issue? Come on. People come together. People come together. But what does it take to move it up that level? Yes, ma'am. Leadership. Oh, leadership. Excellent. What else? It takes a lot of publicity because a lot of people don't know uh, that the public exists. Well, let me rephrase that. How about awareness? Publicity. Awareness. <laughs> awareness? <laughs> oh, yeah. Publicity, right? Okay. So it works. Yes, ma'am. Um, leveraging existing networks. Very good. So leveraging. Yes, ma'am. Partnership with the government to see what there is that we can get them to help with. But partnership, that's the big one. You're right. So you could partnership. So let's summarize. Leadership, awareness, partnerships, leverage. Guess what? You just did all of them. Congratulations. You don't, well, we're done. <laughs> they don't really need us to do it. I asked you to write this stuff down. I wish we would have known that. We would have written to it. Okay, well, let me just, uh, for those who are just coming in, this was a, a very, very important preamble. And as uh, you just heard, it could be done if we all have the ability to now take those lessons and work on it. But we want to learn more, so we're not going to release you yet. Uh, I'm very delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Eric Handler, who is the director of the Orange County Healthcare Agency, and Mr. Paul Young, who is the executive director of the Illumination Foundation. This is a topic that, as you can tell, when we came in here, there were maybe five or six people, <coughs> not only about 16 students, but this is a topic that everybody is interested in. We want to learn from the examples and to find the learning. That's great. So here, I'll do the first half. And we're thank you very much. And we're gonna have a 16 minute video and then I'm gonna turn it over to Paul. But take a look at the board here because what you're gonna see is the principles that are gonna be detailed in our presentation. So I'm gonna you with the top. What's your name? John. John, can you stand up for me? <coughs> look at the chair in your eyes. Come on over here. So try to relax. What sport do you do? Tennis. Dennis, were you any good? Okay. You're kind of shy. Are you the one going? All right, here's my question to you. Can you tell me what the stereotypic homeless individual looks like? I can tell you what I guess my stereotype. Yeah, that's what I'm asking you. Um, probably a person of color, raggedy clothes. <coughs> What else? Uncapped hair. Okay, what else? Unshaven. Does he carry anything? Plastic bag. Okay. So you're saying he's a minority. And it's a he, right? <coughs> yes, my, my stare. Okay. And a minority. Subjective eyes. Okay, so let me. All right, that's fine. <laughs> you don't have to backtrack yet. Okay. All right, so here's my question to you. You ready? Um, out of all the homeless nationally, of all, and if you get this right, you get Paul's comment. Out of all the homeless nationally, what percentage are 10 years of age you You can ask for help, though. Is there anyone that can do that? 20%? I felt like this is the price of right. What do you say? 30%. 30%? It's 50%. So when I asked you about the stereotypical, when I asked you about your stereotypical person, 50% are 10 years of age and younger. 50% are 10 years of age or younger. Think about that. So when you have your stereotypic perspective, it isn't stereotypical by any means. All right. Who am I going to pick on there? Um, you. I knew that you would do that because I looked at you for a minute and that's I'm never good if you don't want to be picked at. <laughs> don't look at me if you don't want to be picked Come on up here. Come on up here. I want you up here. And you. The one who, yeah, look. Back to you. Me. Yeah, come on up here. Yeah, we can <laughs> Oh, this is, you know, they're not friendly here. <laughs> they're all so nervous. Okay, now listen to me. What's your first name? Corey. 
Corey, what's your first name? Ilona. Ilona? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a pretty name. Okay, come on up here. You're married. Is this, let's get this on tape because you heard what they just said. All right, so here is what I'm going to offer you. Okay, I want you to play along with this scenario. You're pregnant. I'd say no more that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you have a five-year-old. Is it a daughter or a son? A daughter. What's her name? April. April. That's, really, that's really nice. Okay. So you arrived from Tennessee a week ago with no money. <laughs> from Tennessee. So. No money. No phone. No car. You're right here in the middle of Orange County. Got it? And somebody says to you, I know a place for you to go. And you go, okay, where? They said, in the middle of Santa Ana is an armory. What's an armory? Do you know? You know what an armory is? Anybody know what an armory is? An armory is where they train soldiers. They convert the armory from November to April to accommodate. 150 to 200 people. Okay? Got it? Mm -hmm. Paul, can you show that slide, please? And to show you that I'm not making this up, this is the armory. They all sleep on blue mats that are this thing. Come on up here. Come on, join me. Love the couple. Stand right over here. Boy. So, you see these mats that you have to sleep on? They're blue mats, they're this, and they're side by side. 200 people under this one room. The mats are side by side. The armory opens up at 6 o'clock at night. Are you going to be in the front of the line or in the back of the line? To get in. I prefer to find an alternative, I think. There isn't. Doesn't look like it matters whether you're the front of the line you or the back of the line. You want to be the front of the back, number one. I like the front. Why? Uh, because there's probably too many people in front of me if I'm in the back and I won't be able to get in. Ah, that's one. You have a five-year-old daughter, April. You're pregnant. <laughs> what kind of people do you think are here? Politicians, scientists, doctors, lawyers? Yeah, not so much. Probably. Not so much. Huh? So, so do you want to let everybody get in in front and choose their spots, or do you want to choose your spot? I guess I'd want to choose my spot. I guess you would too. All right. Everybody agree? Would you? Who would be? Raise your hands in the front of the line. Look at that. Okay. So. Women first, though. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now here's here we. You're going to have to help ask for some help on this next question. All right. Six o'clock at night, it opens. You're fed food, which is jail food, but it tastes pretty good. You're allowed to shower if you can. You came in early, so you picked a corner where you can have your mat on the ground, your mat on the ground. You can watch your five-year-old. The lights go out at 10 o'clock at night. This is what Paul and I saw three and a half years ago. What I'm telling you is a true story. 10 o'clock at night. Do you think you'll sleep through the night? No. Why not? It's probably going to be loud, but nobody settles down at 10 o'clock at night. How about, come here, little girl. Do you think you'll sleep at night? Do you think you'll sleep at night? No, you won't. All right, now, to the crowd, to the group here. What time do they turn on the lights to get everybody up? What time? Five, six, nope. Seven thirty. Ten. Four thirty in the morning. Four thirty in the morning. The lights go on, and you're asked to leave at five o'clock in the morning. Now this is a. You're doing great. So five o'clock in the morning. This is a cold weather shelter. Do you think it's? going to be cold when you walk out? 
You're going to be freezing, aren't you? Yep. All right, so here we go. You're, you see all these people? Mm -hmm. They're going to help you here. They're your life on You now step out of the armory in the middle of Santa Ana at 5 o'clock in the morning. Where are you going to go? <coughs> Try to get something to eat somewhere. Where are you going to go? <coughs> Where are you going to take your five-year-old daughter? Come on, Dad, you better jump in on this. <laughs> Dad, um, yeah, I'd probably take us to like McDonald's or somewhere that's open really early and we could get inside. And I don't think you heard me real well. <laughs> we don't you, have any money. <laughs> she heard me. And in fact, they give you a sack lunch to you, you, and your daughter and say, see you later. We'll give you some food. So now, is it dark out or is it light out? Okay, where are you going to go at 5 o'clock? Come on. This is a true life scenario. Where are you going to go? Any help here? Come on. A park. park. Park? That's a great idea. Guess what? The armory right at Santa Ana has a park right next door to it with no trees. And what kind of clientele do you think are hanging out in that park at 5 o'clock in the morning? Homeless people, and what else? There are prostitutes, there's druggies, and it's dark out. I don't think I'm going to take my pregnant wife and my five-year-old daughter to the park. Come on, get some help here. Daddy, you put me in this school. Where should I go? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? I really don't know. I never thought about where I would go. I, I don't know. I try to find some place where I would get something to eat, where it's warm, where it could maybe change that situation in the long run. That would probably be something that I would try to figure out. I just, I don't know how. And how do you feel as a provider that you have in this situation? I feel pretty low. I feel like a terrible provider. And you're pretty smart, right? You can't figure this out, what are you going to do at 5 o'clock in the morning? Does smart play anything into survival? Yes and no, maybe. Isn't that interesting? You've got to survive, and you have to survive. Great job. Thank you. Okay, so three and a half years ago, Paul and I, Paul called me to see this situation. Now listen, out of 200 people here, I saw 50 kids running around. We saw 50 kids. I walked up to a 12-year-old and I said, tell me, does it bother you to be in this facility? Guess what she said? No. Why did she say no? She has played. Huh? There are 50 kids there. They play with each other. There are 50 kids there? She doesn't know any better. This is all she knows. So of course it doesn't bother her. But when Paul and I saw this, we said to ourselves, are you kidding? In Orange County, is this our legacy? You have 50 kids running around in the armory? Now I'm going to pick on you. Come on up here. You knew I was. <laughs> Come here. I met you where? In the armory. You want to tell them what the Santa Ana armory looked like? It looks like a... Speak louder, you got one. Looks feet. like an airplane hanger. It's huge. And there's mattresses on the floor. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Do you want to tell them about that one young lady that we met? Which one? The, the writer. One the writer. Oh. Uh, we met a few people there. One of them was a young woman. And she said she was in the mortgage industry, and she was fired, and she was a writer, and she just didn't have anywhere else to go. And she was smart, she was intelligent, she was pretty. <coughs> I never imagined seeing somebody like that in you know, homeless children, children. It was pretty impressive, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. There was a 16-year-old uh, uh, high school student that was with me. And I said, why don't you just talk to this lady for about five, ten minutes? And she went off, and the lady showed her her writings, and she was going to write songs.
And all of a sudden, this student comes back to me, and she's got tears in her eyes. And I go, what the heck happened? And she goes, she was just a wonderful person. No different, look at the board, no different than us. No different than us. So, here's what we're going to do. This is the problem that Paul and I were faced. And Paul's going to talk about some of the strategies and solutions we're going to give you and share with you the solutions. But I can tell you, for a year, Paul and I brought in group after group after group into the army. And we said to them, walking in and walking out, you're not going to be the same person walking in. It will change you. And the reason it changed them is because all of a sudden, they saw it. They got it. Now here's the interesting thing. People don't think about the children. We're going to show you a video right now. It's a 16 minute video where children who are homeless are interviewed in Santa Barbara. When you watch this video, I want you to do the following. I want you to look into their eyes. I want you to look at their face. And I want you to think, what would you do if that was your kid? So sit back. It's only 16 minutes and let's run another time. It were a long time. First time when we lived at the shelter was when all of our families were there too, because they were like homeless too. When they said that we were in the shelter, I thought that the shelter would be big. Because the little rooms. And so I just started saying like, but people are going to see me going in there. I don't want them to see me going in there. Because it's going to be embarrassing. I don't tell anyone. I just kind of say like, you know, yeah, my house has this many bedrooms and, you know, I don't really say like where I live because I don't want them to think like that, you know, oh, she's poor, don't say anything about going anywhere, you know? I mean, because, I mean, I could do some stuff, but, but not a lot. I can't like always go to the movies. I can't always go shopping like lots of people, you know? Like there's lots of people that have like all these shoes and I'm like, I don't even have one pair. <laughs> And 
they have like pair like pair of shoes for all their pair of clothes. That's kind of crazy. I used to live at the shelter and we ate food there. I used to live in um the bedroom like room seven. No, wait, what's room one seven? Yeah, eight um and we can we can get any food we want, we can like serve ourselves. Sometimes they serve us and there's a free bathroom. So like kind of weird because I didn't like know anybody there. I'll probably stay in the shelter for a month and a week because they kicked us out of our other house because they were putting the rent higher and they knew we couldn't pay it. So they kicked us out. And then we lived in our car for two days. And then my mom said that we have to go to the shelter. Um, well, I felt um, a little bit um, strange because I, I didn't know anybody. And, um, and at first I didn't know why we came here first. Oh yeah, my friends say that I was here. I didn't, feel, I didn't feel like embarrassed. I was proud of who I am. I don't care what other people say. I just care of who I am and what I do. And I felt a little bit weird the first time, but the second time I was here, I did it. I had a lot of friends, actually, and I talked to all the people here. It was hard getting there on time because um, our car always messed up or something because it, you know, it wasn't a brand new car. You know, it's like. My friends, you know, support me because I tell them, like, my friends, like, some of my friends that I really trust about, like, where I live. And so I think they help me the most. The children are remarkably resilient, but the highly mobile life, living in crowded and noisy shelters, camping, moving from motel to motel, presents them with extraordinary challenges and too often denies them the opportunity to be a child and grow healthy and secure. For these children, education is not only their hope for the future, but critical to their day-to-day -day existence. School can provide stability, security, caring adults, and the tools and resources to survive, as well as a safe place to grow and learn. But going to school isn't always easy. We have to get up, take my sister, both my sisters, to school. And they go to two different schools. And then we have to go pick up my brother, and he goes to my school, so that's a little bit better. And then um, we, um, when, we, when we go to school, I have, I have to like, I don't eat, so I'm like kind of hungry, and it kind of starts my day kind of rough. I had like, I didn't have any A's or B's. I had like C's, D's, and like an F. Because like moving to there was hard because I couldn't do my work because of, you know, um, our homework from people like people there could help us, but they didn't understand some of it. And then it was noisy, so it was kind of hard to concentrate. And then we had something to do like be in at a time and then like be in bed at a certain time and things like that. It's actually kind of hard because you're kind of scared when you move but you're kind of excited at the same time because you lose some of your friends and you make more friends. Yeah, but it's kind of hard to make more friends. I've only got a couple friends that move. So um, like, Alvin, wait no. Um, Alvin go and Loopy School, and then Alvin, and, and then, then Alvin and Alvin and Alvin and Alvin. Four different schools. Four. Yeah. My sister, oh, she would she would look, look over us in the bus stop. She would, she would drop us off and wait for it, wait till the bus came. And then my sister, my big sister, the one that drives, she's on. She's um she she's in college. She does one Monday. She goes to school Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And she would do this there. And sometimes when she would be late to school, she would just drop us off there and wait till the bus came and drop my mom off there. And my mom went wherever. 
because we made friends. I know we went to a different school. We made friends. We went to a different school. We made friends. We went to a different school. I know we stayed at OP. It's hard because um, you like make friends, a lot of friends, and then when you like move to different schools, you don't even tell them bye or something, and then you don't get the number, and like that could hurt them because like they think that you're mad at them. It's too noisy when you eat. I could even do my homework at the table. Because sometimes I do it in my room and then and the, and it's too noisy. Actually, it was because there were a lot of kids there. And I, like, I was trying to, I was struggling to do my homework. Uh, school, I've already missed like eight weeks and six days of school. But it would have been nine weeks, but I went through one day in school up in Portland. <clears throat> so what what ha what happened was uh, after that we just moved right out. We I didn't even get to go say goodbye to any of my friends. It was it was pretty it really stinks. I had a lot of friends that I was depending on going and seeing and playing with uh, for another day. Well, usually we make like these little pit stops so I can do my homework. So I stayed there trying to figure out what school to go. It was kind of hard. But so, um, okay, we're going to get into this school, and then my birth certificate I didn't have. I had to, like, get a temporary one. Let's see. I went to Monroe, went to McKinley, um, I went to Plantation, um, Fairview, Greenfield, um, De Anza, Santa Barbara, and then now Santa Barbara. Going to... Children and youth without a home often have wishes and dreams that are not at all like those of their house peers. They take on the burden of the adults in their lives as a priority. It's sort of like a game of chess. And you make one, if you slip up one, one piece, then you're going to lose that piece. And it really stinks when you lose your pieces because that narrows it down to your last pieces and it's going to be hard to live. You got to make your moves wisely and you got to play them good. Anything helps me as long as I, when I have kids, I can support them as long as I wouldn't like them to be homeless like we were. But as long as they have shelter over their head and food and clothes, I will take care of my, my kids more than me. I wish everybody would quit fighting. Even, you, even when you say hey, it's like somebody who's living, but stop and quit. If I had a wish, I would pick it, pick, get a house or something. Because they don't let you play outside. If you play, they go talk with your parents and they put more money that you need to pay. I wish for a scholarship <laughs> to go to college because I know it's going to be hard to do that. Be rich so my mom won't be poor because we don't have lots of money right now. I had a wish it was for the house. We can have a house. That was my wish. We wouldn't get a house and we'd go to the same school. Keep on going there until we have to go to high school, then college, then get married. A house and a car and clothes and things for my parents. Above all, being homeless is not being hopeless as the children envision a future for themselves. Well, I 
want to be, I want to grow up as a policeman. When I grow up, I want to be a book writer. To study dolphins. I want to be a doctor. A nurse. A girl nurse. Because I have dresses on. A bit. When I grow up, I want to be a doctor. Police one. Yeah, I want to go college. To be a doctor, a pediatrician. I'm not really sure because I want to be all kinds of things. Children, our greatest national treasure and resource, cannot achieve their wishes and goals without support. The responsibility for their future lies with all of us. Life has not given them an easy road, but just one caring adult, one simple act, can make a difference in the life of a child. The first time I was homeless was, well, when I was probably about six. My mom was not able to get a house because of all the evictions that are on your record. There's a lot of homeless kids in this world that need education or else it's going to be hard for them to survive in their life. story there's no question about it and I've been around long enough so I've seen other heartbreaking stories but the issues there like if you want I mean where you're gonna go because of this is I'm sitting here going okay 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 but what can be done uh, you know where are the parents that's part of the issue what's going on with the parents and stuff um, so I'm hoping you're gonna tell us more about that but the, here's the interesting thing what the hell did they do to deserve this situation, regardless <coughs> of the parents. What did they do to deserve this situation? That's not the question. I mean, no, I, no, I'm telling you that's the question. That's what I'm saying. And what's interesting, when you look at these kids, bear with me, we'll get you to your answer. But bear with me, look at this. You look at these children, you look into their eyes. Which one, which had the most impact on somebody? Tell me which child. Somebody want to share? Yes? Uh, the kid with the beanie. Why? Well, you know, he was really, he was just really, he knows that they're homeless and there's a reason they're homeless, but it doesn't matter because as long as he has his mother, you know, that's all that really matters. Yeah. Okay, yes? He also understood about perpetuating the cycle, and so if it isn't the children's fault and they're innocent, then that's where society and education system has to come in and give them an opportunity to change it. In order, because otherwise it'll just continue the cycle. Correct. Anybody else? <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah, the same kid on the beanie who was like, really intelligent to me, and it was just like a normal kid, not normal kid, who was for sure above average. The big one. And he doesn't deserve this. Exactly. Yes, sir. I think it was the, uh, the girl in high school, like, she wanted to go to college, but like, she realizes, like, unless she gets help, like, there's no way she can achieve that. Like, like she knows the way out. It's just, like, she doesn't have the resources. For her. So here's the situation. You've got these kids. You have 50 children in the armory at any one time. And there's two armories, one in Fulton and one in Santa Ana. So let me just fast forward, and then I'll turn this over to Paul. Fast forward. In the past two years, the small we, which was Paul and I, got the big we to say this is unacceptable to have children and families in the armory. For the past two years during the operation of the armory, there wasn't a single child or family in the armory. People gave money to put them into programs and into motels. Let me repeat for you. Not a single family or child was in the armory. 
So when you walk in and say, what can I do as an individual, that's just one small, but for us, huge accomplishment. They don't have to be subjected to that environment, which is honestly horrific. So now, let's get back to our couple who has no place to go. You've got a child on the way. You don't have health insurance. You have no money. You have no cell phone. And you got no car. Where the hell do you go? So, small we, which is Paul, will tell you how we got to the big jungle. Paul. Um, yeah, hi, my name's Paul Leon. I'm the executive direct director of Illumination Foundation. But prior to that, I was a public health nurse, and I'm the one who called Dr. Handler and said, you've got to see this. When we first walked into the armory in that picture, we, we had saw the Santa Barbara <coughs> film that you guys just saw first, and we're thinking, wow, Santa Barbara has a bad. And little did we know that Orange County <coughs> had much worse, much worse. And I've got to start out with the problem, like you were saying, and we'll, we'll tell you what we did for the problem, but you know, our problem was we were living in Orange County. And when we found out how many children, homeless children there are in Orange County, we just had to step back. There are currently, as of, you know, less than a month ago, 17,000 homeless children in Orange County. And I'll repeat that because you've got to, the number just like grabs you, 17,000. And so when we heard that, I was thinking, I don't even see 17,000 kids when I'm going by schools. Where could they all be? Um, and we'll tell you that in a second. But what had happened was when we started looking at different numbers, we realized that California, take a guess where we rank in the nation for homeless children, percentage-wise. We are number two in the nation per population of homeless children. And in, and in California alone, we have the most per population out of all California. We have 47%. Per, the next closest place is Oakland, and they have 23%. All these numbers, by the way, are on this kidsdata.org. Um, so here we are in Orange County, Orange County, California. Dr. Handler and I work for the public health department. We're going like, hey, we've got homeless kids out here. We've got kids in backyards like these pictures here that are living in backyards. They're living in tough sheds. Yet, we have the least amount of funding out of any county in California and one of the least in the nation. Because guess what everybody told us? Orange County Housewives, you guys, you know, they're $45,000, you know, watches. You have the Kardashians. You guys don't have any homeless kids. It became real to me when I went, came to this backyard. And what happened was the armories are, you know, Dr. Handler forgot to tell you, they're only open during the cold weather months. They close. So our first question was, okay, we're doing a pretty good job. We're bringing medical services. We're doing what we need to do as a public health department in the armory. But what do we do when they leave and where do these people go? A lady called me up and said, hey, go to this backyard in Santa Ana and, and most of the kids are there. So Dr. Handler and I walked in there um, one evening, and it was about, oh, seven, eight o'clock. He's talking like usual, playing with his phone, and I'm actually working, um, <laughs> doing blood pressures, getting you know, immunizations, doing what I could do as a public health nurse. This little girl, who happens to be sitting right here, comes up to, actually her mom came up to me and said, you know, my daughter's not feeling good. And when every, every time Dr. Handler and I came in there, they would jump on us, all these kids, because he had given candy, um, <laughs> a public health officer. So they would see us coming and they'd be like all over us. And I noticed she was laying down on a cot. So I walk up to her and I go, you know, oh, you're not feeling well. And she gets said, yeah. So I take her temperature and her temperature is 104 degrees. And we're in, the back, we're in this backyard and she's sleeping on one of these benches along with 60 other kids, as young as two day old. So I take her temperature and it's really high and her little friend sitting next to her and she said, I don't feel good either, Paul. So I take her temperature and hers is higher. So it was like it was yesterday. I'm talking to her and I'm going, 
give your daughter Tylenol, give her this much every six hours, wake her up, take her temperature. If it's still over 100, give her some more till I get here in the morning and don't let her go to school. As I left, it, it was almost surreal. I'm driving home, I get in my car, and it's about 55, 53 degrees. It's, it's really misty out, and it's cold. I turn on my heated seats, and I drive home. I get to my house in San Clemente, and I walk upstairs, and my wife goes, Hun, is that you? And I said, yeah. And she goes, do me a favor. Put Coco in the garage because it's too cold for her to be outside. I stayed awake that whole night and thought about these two little girls and thought, what did they do, as Dr. Hammer said, to deserve this? And I knew at that time, <coughs> when we saw one-year-olds, or one-day-old, two-days-old on apnea monitor machines, we've, we've seen the most horrendous things you could possibly see. I knew we had to do something. And, and just talking about it, we can tell you hundreds of stories. I remember we were at the armory one night, and we go to the bathroom, Dr. Handler and I, and actually they published this in the paper, and it really got an uproar, because we're going to the bathroom, and a nine-year-old walks up and goes, oh, the guy that was just in here stuck a needle in his pee, -pee. Are you guys going to do that? He was shooting up in the bathroom, and a nine-year-old stand up. So we, we immediately went back to the county and said, We've got a problem here, man. We have the, all these kids in these armories. We've got them in the backyard. And their answer to us was, it's a huge problem. We don't even know what to do. And we, at the time, didn't know what to do. And it's just so amazing because the, the things that you put on from a public health department standpoint of view and a public health point of view, we actually just did by mistake. I, I, I was an MBA student. I wasn't a public health student. And I just briefly wrote down out of, a, out of a public health journal the definition of what master or what public health is, and you'll see that we we were able to connect everything we did, just like you know these textbooks say you should. We had no money. We we didn't have the community behind us because no one wanted to hear this. We didn't. We had this huge problem and we had no resources. And I remember they told Dr. Handler, it, Dr. Handler, it is um, leadership without funding. And that was one of our favorite. We just sat there and looked at each other and said, "What are we going to do?" We started just talking to anybody that would listen. We talked to. This is probably our 200. Um, presentation, we started to say, look it, here's what is what is out here. At the same time, we knew after our first presentations that people wanted to throw money at the problem and say, Here, here's some money. And, and we knew money wasn't going to help us. So we started going to the families. And I started out with 10 UCI students, 10. And I grabbed a family that was case managing, and I'm saying, Let's put you in a motel, and then we can work with you and kind of handle your problems, and then next time I go see you, you're not going to be somewhere else. That started three years ago. Since then, you know, too much has happened. I, I, I can't really tell you about it, but it's on our website. We started with about $300, went to $50,000, started our foundation with the help of the MBA school, and now our budgets are going to be about two million, could go up to five million. We have taken 153 families off the street, and they are now in stable housing. 55 of them have graduated. And the, the number one thing that's really, really more, more important to anything at this time, this year, this following school year, we will have 86 students that stayed in the same school for the entire year. And when you think about that, you have to think about the numbers. Wow, we have 22,000 kids, but 86 of them stayed in the same school for an entire year. Last year we had 56. The 56, they, they were on the, you know, they had accolades from school. They all brought up their grade point average. Their behavior started to improve. Everything started to improve. And I wish I could sit there and tell you, wow, it's a magic bullet. We just started doing these things. But basically, I could tell you in a, in a paragraph 
what we did was we stabilized the parents and we said, look, we need to talk to your children. We will help you find housing. We will help you pay for your housing. And we believe in you. We believe that you can make it. We believe that if we help you with some of the benefits you're eligible for, medical, mental health, counseling, that you will change your way. We, our first 20 families, they had bipolar, many of the moms were bipolar. We had paranoid schizophrenics. Our first Christmas in that location, we had a young lady light her hair on fire and run through the motel. Since then, we've had nothing but stability. We've had people that have actually graduated our program. We currently have more mental health. We have more um, people that have suffered from drug addictions than most of the other um, shelters in Orange County. And the way we did it was by we leveraged what we could use. We used mostly students and volunteers. We paid for the instructor and then got all the students for social work, for nursing, for medical students. We used the existing resources and we connected everybody who would listen to us and we, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We were able to get incredible partners like um, Pacific Life, St. Joseph Hospital, Kaiser. Currently, I think we have about 70 partners. Um, and if you go to our website, it, we, we began breaking the cycle. Because now instead of having grandmothers who have their, their kids running around the street, or having their kids, and then having their grandchildren running around the streets, we at least stabilized them. And then the number one, number one thing to me which really makes a difference as far as even attempting to, to handle this problem, we have currently about 74, 75 child-bearing women of that age in our program. They've been there two years um, through our program and our graduate program. We have had one pregnancy. One. So when we first started, out of those ten women, eight of them were pregnant. So we, I wish, like I said, I wish we could come up here and tell you, wow, it was a magic bullet. It took time, it took effort, and it took the same things that you guys were saying. We had to bring in the community. We had to use volunteers. We had to bring in mental health. We had to bring in nursing. But as a whole, every aspect of these children's lives have, have improved. And yeah, we don't have kids in the armory, and we still have a huge problem ahead of us. But we found in, in many ways, we figured out the formula, and we can, we can actually create more motels and more places for these people to come, but we need more partners, we need more volunteers. And um, like I said, it, if you would have asked us three years ago it, uh, if this would have been possible, we would have said no. So. Whose backyard is this and is there a licensing for having kids? This is the Isaiah House. It's a, it's a family that lives in Orange County and they open up their backyard. And to answer your question, no, there is, you don't need a license. You can open up your backyard and let people stay there. However, we, we have all the kids now. They're not in backyards. Most of the kids come up through our program. But that, that's a great question because a lot, what would happen a lot of people would say, well, what happened to social services? What happened to child, you know, child protection? You have to pretty much either use drugs in front of your children or molest them or leave them alone for long periods of time for the county to be able to take them. Otherwise, they, they won't even come out to even talk to you about them if you think there's abuse. So when, when you, you know, people always said, all of a sudden say, hey, how about regulation? Isn't the county take care of this? We are the county. We are the public. So, um, Again, I, I know an hour is just such a short time to tell you all the stuff that we learned, but hopefully um, we passed out some brochures and you can go to our website and we have a sign-up list here if you guys want to find out more or volunteer because I tell you, almost everything that you guys said, we're actually physically doing in all four of our programs. So Here's the take-home message. What is public health? You're going to get your master's in public health. So what? Uh, your job is to find out where there are gaps, 
and how to fix those gaps. What are the things that you need as to be involved with public health? You have to have passion. You have to have leadership. And through that, you create awareness among your partners. That's what it's all about. That's it. It's that simple. Let me give you one example. How many here have heard of the group MIA? How do you know MIA? Um, I joined it my senior year of undergrad, and I'm the blood master. Well, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> this is an incredible group. Why don't you tell them about MIA? So, um, MIA is a UCI School of Medicine organization that um, provides tutoring, uh, fitness education, nutrition education for these kids at um, the Illumination Foundation's motor homes. And we also volunteer with Kaiser um, doctors and nurses, and we have a mobile clinic that stations around armories <laughs> that they mentioned, Fullerton, Santa Ana, and um, other areas <laughs> around Orange County. So it's UCI undergraduates, it's UCI medical students, and what's interesting, the medical <coughs> students saw the armory and they went, what the heck are we going to do about this problem? What, how can we help? What can we do? And I said, I can't answer that for you. You have to figure out what's best, what resources you have to bear. And the medical students formed this group called MIA, Medical Initiative Against Homelessness, recruited undergraduate and graduate students, and we were able to secure for them $15,000 to help them with their effort. And it's an incredible organization. So I would suggest that if you're interested in getting involved, if you stay here, maybe they can, you can help sign them up. Thank you. The bottom line here is, is the starfish story. That's the small weed. The story is two people are walking along the shore and there are thousands of starfish washed ashore. And one kid keeps on throwing one starfish back into the ocean at a time. And his friend says, what are you doing? There's thousands here. And he said, for that one starfish, it's going to get one. Not only did we touch people's lives, Paul and I, but they touched us. They, we were touched as much as we touched them. Paul and I never, ever worked with the homeless until we came here. Shame on us if this is going to be our legacy. Shame on us. And you all can make a difference. So what we're going to do for the last five minutes is open it up to any questions you might have. Yes, sir. I cut a couple of them here. Yeah. Uh, just like I mean, you said, but I missed it. The your your program has addressed how many kids now? Actual kids over three hundred. We've had total come through our program is about a hundred and I think sixty four now, roughly, because they they're graduating every day. So, so it's great. But you told us in the beginning we have seventeen thousand. Right. So, uh, is your program scalable so that it can be reproduced to different sites and do the same thing? That's number one. Number two is, is it something, because waiting for two passionate guys like you to come along, who are also, passion by itself doesn't necessarily do it, although it's an important factor, but you have to have leadership. Maybe the two don't go together, somebody's a jerk of passion. It's, it's, it seems like it needs to be scaled up and organized, and I'm just asking you the question, your opinion, I'm not saying you know the answer. Are we a county, as a county, are we a society? And, and somewhere, you didn't mention it here, but I think it was on your website or I saw it somewhere, we like have more millionaires in this county than anybody in any other county in the country. Do we have the social um, thoughtfulness, whatever the right word is, to say, this is a great program. We need to tax ourselves to set up something like this so we can scale it. Do you think more you know, people can do that? Oh, I to answer your question, first of all, yes, this is scalable, but I, I've got to also mention it's not only us. Our name is Illumination Foundation because we really wanted to be advocates and illuminate the problem. We knew that if we sh you know, shone light on the problem, that more people would help. And something as simple as Mia, you know, the group of, of medical students that got together and non-medical students, anybody that wanted to join, 
I can't tell you how many hundreds of kids they tutor. And they, they go there every Thursday night and Sunday. And you think, well, we have 17,000 homeless people, but they're only tutoring maybe 500. But you start multiplying that out, and we've seen how much we've grown and how many people we're helping now. But not only us, we kind of put pressure on other nonprofits to do the same thing. And I know Mercy House, Orange County Rescue Mission, Families Forwards, a lot of different groups, a lot of churches that become involved now. A lot more people, I don't want to say they didn't know about the problem, I don't know they knew about the extent, but, but it kind of forces you to say, you know what, come on now, we're the highest in, in California and the second highest in the nation. It forces people to kind of take a look at it. And I, I think Dr. Handler said the best out of anybody. And, and because there was a lot of people that said, yeah, I like kids and stuff, but you know, I'm busy. I got my boat in Newport Beach, and and Dr. Harris said, "Wow, one day where the kids were all running crazy," and he said, "These little kids are really cute now, but when they're 18 and they got a gun in our face, they're not going to be so cute." And so it is a systemic problem. It's a society problem. The amount of pressure that we see on these children, 80 percent of them live with trauma post-traumatic um, stress syndrome every day. So, I mean, you know, we can go on and on and tell you they're the sickest, they're the malnourished, they're the most, they don't even hit the, the grid. So, our one thing is that our this problem is huge, but we also talked about that when we were in Newport Beach one time, is that if we really, as an as a Orange County, and we had everybody involved, and we wanted to wipe this out, they could do it in two months if we had everybody on board. But I, obviously it hasn't happened yet, and it probably won't happen tomorrow, but by us getting a few people, and you keep you know, getting this grassroots movement. And I never understood two things. One, I never understood grassroots. I've seen it work now, and I've never understood public health. I, I never, I, even though I was a public health nurse, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. But you see, we ended up just because of the need, we build it, um, and a and a lot of people who who helped us. Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious how you raised so much money from the two hundred dollars to five million dollar budget. Ah, that's an easy one. <laughs> Awareness and partners, because we took the small wheat and made it a big wheat. And when you show when you shine a light on the problem, people can't walk away. Not that the county and other people were not doing things with the issue, but when you have a joint outcry of people saying this is unacceptable, it forces you into action. So who's the biggest contributor? Well, the biggest, we've got private uh, people, and we also have the county. So it's a true partnership. It's a private-public partnership. Well, also, so give you some what, was, what was the first, uh, California is number two, who's number one? Dallas, Texas. Texas. And you know what's so weird because I just found out last night because I kept thinking, why Texas and why Texas? Anybody got an idea? <coughs> All you masters of public health? Katrina. Katrina? Yeah, who said Katrina? Katrina. I, I didn't even dawn on me. I thought, are they just because they're big and they have more kids? They have more displaced homeless kids in Texas than Louisiana and Georgia. But it's crazy. when If you go to this site and you look at, because it gives you the national numbers, you see like Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, and California is like right there. And you're thinking, how the hell could we, and Orange County is the highest in California. You're thinking, how could we do that? You know, how could we be that high up? I know it's uh, past the one o'clock. I'm going to leave you one last story to show you that, that the reason we're so passionate is we love what we're doing. And I love telling this story. Remember the Isaiah house with the backyard? There were like 75 children in the backyard. It was a summer day and it was hotter than you can imagine. Paul called me one afternoon and he says, I have this vendor in a very shady part of Santa Ana that will sell us cheap ice cream. Like a popsicle. And I go, okay, Paul. I said, listen, I'm a public health officer. I'm responsible for the health and safety of 3.2 million dollars, million people. And I go, where do you want to meet me? He says, I'll be outside. And he picks me up and we go to this shady vendor. And we bought, at using our own money, 50 popsicles. And at that time, too, Paul was complaining that, as usual, he was hungry and he took one of the popsicles, so we had now 49. I'm a pediatrician. 
I know children. I was going to put the 49 popsicles on the tray, walk into the backyard, and then distribute one by one to all the kids each one of those popsicles. What do you think happened when I had the tray of 49 popsicles and I walked into the backyard? Huh? They were attacked. They didn't last 30 seconds. It was gone in a flash. I'm going, boy, that was just a smart plan that I've tried to implement. The kids loved it. And I'm just about walking back into the house when a seven-year-old kid comes up to me and he says, can I have one? Seven years old. I go, what do you want? Can I have ice cream? And I'm going, oh, how am I going to get out of this? And I said, you know, we had all this ice cream and we did have one for you. But he ate the <laughs> True story. And she, when the kid walked up to Paul, asking for ice cream, Paul was trying to barter with him by giving him, uh, offering Gatorade, changing his pocket, and everything else. But fortunately, there was a woman who did have an extra popsicle and gave it to him. The point of the story is the following. If this journey wasn't a pleasure, and if the journey wasn't rewarding, we wouldn't be doing it. And this is public health at its best because we are taking the lead, and we are making a difference, and we're bringing people together to do that. So thank you very much.